I'm really pleased to welcome you to today's uh, water lecture. Um, we have a <coughs> distinguished speaker, uh, Jeremy Bird. Uh, CB was in the invitation. Is the Director General of the International Water Management Institute, IMI, based in Sri Lanka. IMI is one of the uh, 16 international agricultural research centers of the consultative group on international agricultural research. Uh, actually a very important one because it combines water and land management issues. And um, as you know, climate adaptation, adaptation <coughs> to climate change <coughs> is virtually all about water. Um, Jeremy Bird is, uh, uh, Jeremy, I started introducing Perfect. you. Perfect. Uh, you, you know it. <laughs> I didn't reveal any secrets. Uh, Jeremy has a distinguished career um, in his field. Before he became IMI Director General, he was uh, uh, the director of the Mekong River Commission. Uh, and. Uh, it's of course one of the water hotspots in today's age, that river, uh, which uh, is so essential for hundreds of millions of people in Asia. Um, today's lecture uh, will be on solutions for a water secure and urbanizing world. Uh, broadly speaking, uh, Jeremy, you have an audience of water experts and uh, people which have a lot of experience in water issues. This is a series of lectures. If someone experienced in matters of water, water policy, technology related to water comes by in Bonn, we invite um, these colleagues to this so-called uh, water lecture. Um, we very much look forward to your presentation. Um, I hope you can limit it to about half an hour so that we still have some good discussion with you. Welcome again to Tsef. Uh, I think it's your second or third second, 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 second visit yeah. only. There should be a third one soon. <laughs> and it's a pleasure <laughs> that you've good. made it possible. Okay. Please, thank you very much. Welcome our speaker. Yeah. Thank you, Joachim, and uh, apologies for being a little bit late and keeping you waiting. Um, I'm a bit worried when somebody introduces the audience as being water experts. I wonder what sort of questions you're going to get in the, uh, in the session afterwards. So water security in an urbanizing world. Why have I got a picture of an urban area here in, uh, in Sri Lanka? And that will come a little bit obvious as we go through the, the conversation this afternoon. So agriculture has been a success story. We've had uh, tremendous growth of agriculture over the years, keeping pace with, with demand. And uh, particularly in some countries like India, which were considered to be a breadbasket in our concern, many 30, 40 years ago have been able to now end up with surplus uh, production. Um, the level of undernourishment has, has reduced significantly. Uh, places like Vietnam, where the numbers have really significantly reduced over time, have uh, been some of the success stories of uh, the last 20, 30 years. But still, there's many areas, as we know, which uh, have lack of access to food, and are undernourished, and high levels of poverty. But that agricultural development has also come at quite a cost, a cost to the environment in terms of land and water degradation. I'm not going to go through the numbers, but I think you can see already the sense of this conversation is around the interlinkages between water and other areas, and the, the pressures of growth which are going to come also from the urban environment in the future. So the first point I meant to make, and there's three basic threads to this discussion. One is around water in an urbanizing world and the pressures from urbanization. The second is going to be around the waste and looking at waste differently, waste as a resource. And the third, looking at some of the supply of water to these sorts of areas, which is going to be a concern in the future groundwater. So on the first of these, this is just a, uh, some remote sensing pictures from uh, 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 Hyderabad over the last decade or so, 
showing the significant range, so of, uh, extent of expansion. And this is within, or half a generation, not even one generation, you see this sort of scale of expansion. And the consequences for that in terms of where is this going to get its water from, you know, you're seeing increasingly over time it bringing water in from further and further away. So initially from the Musi River and then gradually expanding out into the Krishna Basin and cross basin transfers from the uh, Godavari Basin, <coughs> increased use of, of waste, of uh, groundwater and uh, increased um, use of wastewater uh, downstream. And over time, we're going to see many more of the city of the countries we're working in move towards an urbanized world. Two thirds of the population will be in urban centers in the next 20 to 30 years. And as that happens, accompanied by forms of industrialization, you'll see the shift of water use going from more than 80 percent now in some of the low-income countries to uh, to about 30 percent, and industry taking a much larger share of that water. And one of the drivers for change and increasing demand of water is also the shifting diets. You're seeing greater uh, amount of meat and milk being used in uh, in China and India, in particular. You can see the scale of the change there over time. Um, on a logarithmic basis, a scale there on the bottom, um, which is quite striking. And that has a significant impact on the amount of water that's needed to, to, to grow that, uh, that protein. And the population rise, I mean, we all see Asia as the major center of population at the moment, where we are now, 2000 there with Asia, I mean, 61% roughly of the population. Africa only 13% on a total population, well that was 2000, <coughs> 2015 we're above 7 billion and rising and as we go through up to 10 or maybe 11 billion in the future by the end of the century, look at the proportions of where that population is going to be and Africa on the right hand scale there you'll see absolutely dramatic change. So going from something like 1 billion people now to 4 billion people by the end of the century. And Again, as I say, a large numbers of those in the urban in the urban areas. So these are the big drivers of change <coughs> that are happening, which we're all very familiar with. But I thought useful just to reflect upon, uh, to set the scene. And coming back to that first slide, why did I show a rural slide at the beginning? Well, this is from Nepal, and we've seen there a tremendous shift in the demographics, and agriculture has now become very much, uh, as we say, the fem we've seen the feminization of agriculture. And so people left in the rural areas because of urban migration to the Middle East, in particular in this case. In other cases, urban migra uh, mi male migration to the, uh, to the urban areas. Seeing a significant change in the demographics, people left in the rural areas responsible for farming. But you haven't seen a consequent changes in the institutional structure, in the incentive structures, to allow access of those women to resources. <coughs> And so I think this, this is something we really have to look at seriously as a consequence of, of development and as a consequence of, of urbanization. Um, also, we're seeing an aging farming population, and that has some concerns for the future. Average age of, uh, is, over six, is around 60 at the moment. And whereas 20, 30 years ago in some of the countries I was working in, like Vietnam, there were concerns about fragmentation of land holdings as inheritance set in, now you're seeing what's happening in many parts of East Asia is actually consolidation of land holdings, which provides some opportunities for efficiencies in agriculture uh, that were not there maybe 10 or 20 years ago. And then in the West, we see already a recognition that you can't just look at one sector uh, on its own. And I think this is you know, a very interesting slide, and it just shows this interlinkage and the complexity of trying to address some of these development challenges when we look at uh, issues around water, energy, waste, food um, in, in an urban environment. And, but unless you do this, unless you do take this more holistic perspective, then, then you're going to be very inefficient in terms of the reuse of your resources. And I think you know, if you're looking at the scale of the population rise and the urbanization in some of the countries, uh, regions we were talking about, in, in Africa, it just would be unsustainable unless you move towards this sort of more integrated approach to development. 
And we've already seen you know, how, in terms of water supply, this has changed over time. Maybe 30 years ago, you know, Hyderabad needed more water. You have a cross-basin transfer. That's the first thing you can do once you've run out of water in your own basin. You take water out of agriculture. But maybe there are other cheaper <coughs> options of doing that. I mean, looking at uh, uh, controlling leakage, which can be 20 to 40, 50% of the water supply in many countries, looking at demand management, rainwater harvesting, etc. Uh, use of grey water for particular industrial uses which can also be cheaper options than, than looking at new source development. So that's the sort of the urban field. So the, the, idea, the, the idea there is really to take more of a, uh, an integrated perspective to urban water management. And one element of that is waste. And, and we see that waste is a resource which is seen as a problem in most countries. So how do we turn that around? How do we start to look at waste as an opportunity? This picture taken from Ghana shows uh, waste from septic tanks, which is just illegally dumped uh, in an open area and then filters down into the sea. You see similar stories. I've got similar photographs from across uh, Asia and Sri Lanka, where I'm living at the moment, being dumped into land, land sites, uh, wetland areas, rivers, etc., polluting the environment. Um, so, but this is actually also a resource. How to change the mindset and the change the thinking around, around that. And worldwide, and we haven't got very clear figures on it, but something up to around 20 million hectares of, of irrigation comes from waste water, and mostly in very unsafe conditions. And this was a, a significant problem for many countries because they said, well, we can't use wastewater for irrigation because it's effectively being, being banned by the international community. The WHO guidelines don't allow us to use it. Um, uh, you know, but still, of course, we know it's happening. And this just gives you an indication of, uh, of some of the numbers. In three out of four cities in developing and emerging economies, farmers are using polluted irrigation water for the production of high-value crops particularly in the peri-urban areas where there is a market for you know, vegetables, for salad crops and things just on the doorstep. So it's quite high value uh, activity. The amount of in the fourth column along there, you'll see the amount of treated wastewater is actually relatively small um, as, a, as, a, as a total. And this was some work that uh, Pai Drexel and our team did to try and identify, you know, well, what is the scale of that, and what was the driver for using wastewater? So the bottom graph actually shows the wastewater that's been treated in these, in these, and being used in these countries as part of the formal sec sector, and the driver for that was scarcity of water, insufficient surface water, insufficient groundwater, and it was a planned use of wastewater treated to the level it needed to be to provide safe, uh, 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 safe agriculture and controlling the health risks in the top graph, though, this is the area of the informal sector where it's not been treated. Un untreated wastewater, which actually then provides the health risk. And just as an example uh, of some of the issues, this work from Ghana, showing the number of treatment plants that were installed uh, to treat waste to a standard that could then be used in agriculture. And then we ask the question, well, how many of these work? And that's the answer. So going from, sorry. That's going away. Okay, so from going from there to there. And they're not working for a number of reasons. Lack of capacity, lack of finance, a whole re series of reasons. Poor design, inappropriate design, these sorts of things. So what we're seeing, I think, in many cases, it will be more than a generation between, before some of these countries are in a situation to be able to treat the water to the level is required. Uh, what other options are there for the use of this water, which is going to happen? It's not a question of us saying, well, don't use the wastewater. It's there. There's a market there. It's going to happen. It is happening, as you can see again from pictures from Ghana. Just on this, this very transient area, the peri-urban area, which may be, you know, Lettuce crops today, it may be urban development tomorrow, but then the, that will then just spread out as the, as the development increases. So 
what does, and then you can see, well, from a farmer's perspective, not bad. You can get these sorts of results with the natural wastewater, whereas if you use the city pipe, pipe water supply, you'd have to add an awful lot of fertilizer to be able to get the same, the same result. So what we did was to work with a number of organizations, including FAO, WHO, EPA, to try and say, well, how can we change the, the youth guidelines on wastewater to come up with something which is then acceptable and reduce the transmission of pathogens from the waste to the agricultural products. And it's still a work in progress. Many of these guidelines have now come, come on stream. Um, some of the communities where we've been working here in, uh, in Ghana are adopting them. Very low-tech solutions in many cases, things like low head drip systems to take the water directly to the root zone to, to, to stop um, splash onto the vegetable crops. Um, putting in inter intermediate uh, small storage areas, small little ponds, to allow uh, settling out of some of the higher risk pathogens before it's used for irrigation. Different types of attachment to the ends of watering cans so it doesn't spray across the whole crop, but goes, goes directly down to the root system. What we haven't done yet, I think, is to look at, well, we haven't got very far yet, is what is a certification system needed to back this up to give confidence to the consumer that the crops are grown using these guidelines. And that's something which is still work in progress. So that's the story for wastewater. Um, now if we look at the waste solid, more solid waste issues, and particularly we've been focusing on fecal sludge, so the human waste that is uh, emptied from septic tanks in non-sewered systems, which comes into the, as I said before, in the environment, uh, or lakes or rivers or that. Scale of you know, 2 million tons of waste here. Um, uh, 128 million septic tanks in India contributing <coughs> to 80% of the pollution of the surface water. So it's a significant issue. And there is some treatment, but it's very, very small. Um, so, and this is just uh, another, this is a diagram from Kumasi in, in, Kenya, in Ghana, where we'll try to f map out and demonstrate, well, first of all, the complexity of the system, but secondly, you know, where is the waste coming from and where is it going? And, and but looking at the waste as a positive now, looking at the nitrogen content of that waste and, and, and where it's going and where it's ending up at the bottom here in terms of groundwater and surface water or in, in the soil. So these waste flows are then brought up the question is how can you how can you start to capture some of those waste waste flows? And we've done this is not new. I mean this is not something that IMI has, uh, has pioneered itself, but what we have done is to look at some of the business models that have uh, been used over the world, in this case you know, 150 or so different business models. Uh, and for different purposes, waste also as a fertilizer, maybe as a source of energy. And what's quite clear from a number of these is that it's not, often it is not sustainable for various reasons. Either transport costs are too high, or the subsidies on chemical fertilizers preclude organic fertilizers coming into the market, or whatever. So we want to learn from here, what are the key factors that make a business model sustainable? And then can we build on that? Can we improve on that? So we went through uh, looking at uh, cases in more detail, identified 22 different business models and tried out uh, uh, feas had feasibility studies in 10 cities to identify what the, the critical criteria were. Um, and we're talking about a value proposition that adds to the, the normal use. So here we have you know, questions about water recovery, different options here, water recovery for irrigation, recovering the, the nutrients and organic recovery, using it for fish food, using it for energy, uh, using it for industry or whatever. And I think what's important is there are multiple, multiple uses and each context will determine you know, in terms of where is the market, what is the best use of that waste. We've developed now a, a business catalogue with a whole series of different business models that have been reviewed on the use of this waste. Uh, and then this is hopefully something we'll now develop into a, a massive online uh, training course which can actually help disseminate it in more, in more detail. And that should be available towards the, end of this, towards the end of this year. And this is one of the, one of the things we've been looking at and pioneering in, in Ghana, uh, and getting the value out of fecal sludge. Very simple, 
you know, emptying from the septic tank, something that's happening already. The tankers are there, they're, they're happening, they're taking this waste, as I say, either dumping it in the sea or some other place. But can we then put it into a different type of treatment process, which actually then leads to adding value? And here, you're going through a sludge drying process, um, co-composting with other uh, nutrients if needed, depending on the fertilizer you want, blending, and then coming up with a, a, a Pelletized fertilizer looks just the same as any other uh, chemical fertilizer on the market for a price which is attractive and through the tests that we've done, providing a yield response which is competitive with the chemical fertilizer. So we started with very small scale trials in, Ga in Ghana and now that's, we've got the interest of a, a private sector company who is investing in a plant uh, next to the existing uh, waste treatment plant in the municipality and hopes to make this into a commercial operation uh, by the end of this year. Uh, so that's just a few photographs of the, of the process. First of all, the, the tanker emptying into the, um, into the uh, drying area, and then the co-composting, and then bottom right is the actual final, final product. And it's, it's not quite that simple, of course. The, the moisture content of the sludge and everything else it determines uh, the type of process you have and the length of composting and drying. But um, this is, again, through these various business models is something we're getting a little bit of experience in. And then adapting that, we've got uh, operations in Ghana, in India, and also in Sri Lanka, uh, which seem to be uh, gathering quite a lot of interest. And so it's this, you know, beyond the, the access to sanitation, the concerns about the MDG, you know, which only really focused on, on sanitation, what happens to the waste afterwards? And I think with the STC, SDGs, this is beginning to come into the equation a little bit more. So looking at the, the sanitation service chain right down to disposal and then reuse is going to be more and more important as we go forward. Uh, just another uh, set of um, slides showing you where these different business cases were. And again, looking at the the various activities that we have, advisory services for various uh, development agencies. ZEF is going to be involved in terms of looking at an investment climate study to say what is the potential for this for these sorts of products. Getting more involved with the private sector because ultimately it's the private sector which is going to be essential for this to take off commercially. In, in Sri Lanka we have a particular uh, issue because of um, uh, the subsidies on chemical fertilizers, so can we work with the governments to try and at least, you know, if they can't remove those subsidies, which is clearly problematic, then can they at least provide the same level of subsidy to organic fertilizer and then the sort of capacity development services that are needed to spread, spread information uh, and uptake <coughs> of, this, of this work. Within the SDGs, we're working uh, in some of the indicators around this to try and identify and then, and, and, uh, you know, what are the mechanisms by which we can actually monitor uh, achievement of the, of the recycling? Uh, so in other words, you know, what happens when the pit, pit is full is the question. And we've come up, you know, as many others have done, with these types of diagrams in terms of trying to track the information. So the top part, this is Kathmandu, the top part shows you know, the toilets connected to the to sewers, the others which have on-site uh, facilities. So in here, and then what we try and show is in the current situation that even those areas which are connected to the sewers, in fact, because the treatment isn't there, then in effect that also goes back down. The red area at the right-hand side goes back down into uh, the, the rivers, etc. cetera. Um, at the moment, we're, we're focusing on this part of the diagram in terms of the sewer, the non sewered areas but ultimately we want to look at the, the sewer areas as well, which will need a different, um, a different probably a different response. Um, so with the various investments that have been proposed for Kathmandu, we're hoping that the diagram on the left will actually start to look like the diagram on the right by 2030. Um, but still, uh, there's a long way to go before that actually, that actually happens. And this is the same sort of thing, but at a country level, and looking at the numbers, and some of the, this is work has been fed into the discussions around the SDG monitoring process. So how do you get information, that complexity, to, to tell you whether or not you're compliant with an SDG or not? And of course, this information is relatively easy to get hold of, 
you know, the extent of toilets, uh, connections, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But what's not very easy to get hold of is this sort of issue in this area in the middle in terms of the, the fecal sludge, and and how can we get that information at a cost which is uh, which is viable? So that's our that's our challenge at the moment. Um, but fortunately, some of this in, some of this work is, is is coming into general general usage. So where, what are we looking at uh, in questions of the rural urban linkages, particularly around waste, is uh, looking at these sorts of business models on uh, resource reuse and recovery, uh, how to bring that into health risk assessments and guidelines for risk mitigation. Uh, I think one of the challenge, big challenges there is this question of the, the institutional framework which governs that peri-urban area. The scale of development I showed you on that Hyderabad slide is not matched by the changes in institutional responsibilities for looking after it. I mean, what were rural areas now become urban areas, but are they being planned for that? And, and, and what are the, uh, then the trade-offs you know, between the urban and the rural areas in terms of the incentives that may be required to support agriculture to make it more productive under SDG 6 that may be financed from the urban sector which will allow then transfer of water to the to the urban sector. What are the you know the, the, the costs associated with with treating some of this waste or dealing with some of this waste to avoid then the increased pollution load as a result of urban development? So I think some of these sort of things we're looking at in, in terms of both policy and institutional frameworks, doing the feasibility studies, trying to identify what good uh, best practice is and getting it out there um, and having those sorts of discussions with these these. Um, development agencies which are su supporting uh, the, the uh, integrated urban water management. Now the third and last area I wanted to talk about a little bit was groundwater and this is linked because much of the water for those urban developments is coming from groundwater rather than surface water but we see it as you know, a potential crisis both in terms of the quantity available and over abstraction which then marginalizes the ability of farmers to, to access that water or uh, communities for drinking water, and also increasingly in terms of its water, the water quality concerns. So just to give you some scale, this uh, in terms of the groundwater expansion in the last 60 or 70 years, and you can see all the, the sort of astronomic expansion there in India <coughs> as a result of policy uh, for free uh, electricity to agricultural use of wells. And that then in turn, quite sure what that one was for, uh, that one in turn show, is, is translated into these uh, areas of massive over abstraction. Quite interesting sort of east west divide between the country there. You know, so on the, the western areas in Punjab and Gujarat and others, uh, and down in the peninsula of India, large areas of over exploitation of groundwater. And yet in the eastern Gangetic Plain, you see still large areas where you have annual replenishment and still plenty of scope. So this is a consequence of perverse subsidies on, on electricity. And then on the right-hand side, the lack of groundwater access has actually been limited by perverse uh, licensing and regulatory frameworks, which have not encouraged small-scale farmers to use, to use uh, groundwater in the same way they have elsewhere. This was one uh, piece of work I'm sure I presented before, but basically very quickly, you know, we've, we've been talking about these subsidies in, uh, in India. Uh, the World Bank for 20, 30 years has been trying to get governments to remove the subsidies to uh, modify the use of, of water, and it hasn't worked. It's just been politically unacceptable. No politician was ex on a five-year election time frame is going to take that decision. So one of our colleagues, Tushar Shah, said, OK, in that, in that scenario, can we look at other alternatives? And then he came up with this idea of separating the feeder lines. So you have one feeder line of electricity going to a community to say, right, we will guarantee you 24-7 supply for your villages. But in return, we'll have a separate feeder line to the agricultural wells, which will give you eight-hour rotations. And just to ensure there's no cross-fertilization between these, we'll put one in at 220 volts and one in at 330 volts. And it, it worked. I mean, you look at the, the difference between Gujarat uh, back in, in uh, 2000 compared to 2008, and you see some recovery of the groundwater. Uh, farmers were far more uh, efficient with the use of water, so it reduced the overall consumption of electricity, 
Uh, in fact, yields actually increased as well, which was quite a surprising byproduct of this. Of this. And to some extent, this program, Jyotigram, has been expanded in other states of India as a result. Um, in West Bengal, where I say that the, the, the opposite was the case, where there was uh, inadequate use of groundwater potential, which was there, um, we came up with a suggestion that, well, if you actually put in a licensing, uh, a, 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 a non-requirement for licensing for small pumps, up to about five uh, kilowatts, and, uh, and, and uh, get rid of the connection charges for those pumps, you could actually get quite a significant, significant increase without threatening the overall resource. And that has um, been implemented, and we've seen, we've done, recently done an impact study of that work, and it's shown quite a significant uptake uh, across, across the states in, in uh, eastern parts of, of India. Um, increased productivity, but a slight concern that farmers are now moving towards very water consumptive crops. So how do we then, you know, maybe that, that, that uh, model needs to be tweaked a little bit to try and increase water productivity a little bit further. Soil irrigation is another area we've been working on in India. Many states in India have been promoting with very large subsidies soil irrigation as a climate mitigation measure with no connection to other uh, agricultural um, policy, policy measures. And the concern there is, yes, it, it's great to be able to replace <coughs> electric wells um, which are generated by diesel or uh, other fossil fuels with solar irrigation, but if the sun keeps shining, the pumps will be left on. Groundwater will then be over-extracted, you probably get water logging and, and uh, non-optimal uh, yields of, of crops. So we started talking, or Tusha Shah, uh, who's involved with our program with Tata, in India started talking to various policymakers to say, well, you know, how about feeding in the excess power from these solar irrigation pumps into the grid, like we do here in Europe uh, for our rooftop uh, PV cells? But the, the concern there was that they don't, that the utilities didn't want to deal with hundreds of thousands of millions of individual farmers. So the idea was to come up with a cooperative, which would be an intermediary between the, farm, the, the solar irrigation pumps and the um, and the utilities, something up to about a half megawatt or one megawatt. And this is what's being trialed at the moment. So it's not the technology which is new, it's this institutional structure and getting the pricing right so that farmers have a, an incentive to be able to be more efficient with their water uh, in irrigation to be able to then sell excess power to the, to the uh, utility. And in, in Karnataka, I think the, the pricing was, was skewed one way which actually meant that, uh, in fact, the farmers put all their electricity back into the grid and not into agriculture. And now in Gujarat, we're trying out, they're trying out a slightly different pricing policy, which is more of a balanced, balanced incentive system. So various um, uh, multiple benefits, if this works. Uh, I mean, not only is there a, an increase in the amount of power that's generated from green power, but you get uh, returns to the utilities, you get a reduction in, in the subsidy uh, that the utility has to provide, um, and you get uh, increased uh, production from groundwater and, and reduced groundwater uh, CO2 emissions. Uh, I mentioned quality, and this is just one slide on, on some of the concerns up in the north of, of Sri Lanka uh, in terms of potential for saline intrusion and potential for also uh, non-point pollution from uh, agri increasing agriculture as after the war we're seeing more and more development happening in, in Jaffna. So over the year the salinity conditions increasing because of to totally uncontrolled, unregulated use of groundwater. So what, what systems are going to be needed to be put in place to have a more sustainable use of, of the resource in that case? Going to Africa, most of my slides have been from Asia. You know, I think very little much less is known about the groundwater potential in Africa. <coughs> We're beginning to uncover what that potential is, and ha but how sustainable is it? Are the institutions, are the incentive frameworks <coughs> going to be put in place to ensure we don't have that same story that we saw in Western uh, India occurring in, 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 uh, in Africa? We've done some work under the <coughs> Gates-funded programs in terms of looking at uh, the opportunities for 
uh, bringing rain-fed farmers into the irrigation market by, again, looking at uh, incentives through the policy frameworks to encourage small-scale entrepreneurs, for example, here to provide irrigation services to a series, to a number of farmers in their, in their vicinity um, and, 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 and other mechanisms. So again, and, and this I think we see as one of the, the big breakthroughs in terms of the big increases in production and livelihoods can come from taking that first step from rain-fed farming into supplementary irrigation. So for groundwater, we, we, we've done quite a lot of work in groundwater. We recognize there's a lot of other programs out there working in this area. The Global Environment Facility has just uh, finished the first phase of its ground, groundwater governance program. It's come up with some interesting ideas around uh, uh, regulatory frameworks and things. But they're still at a sort of generic level. So the, the focus we want to look at now is to try and give more exposure and information around the types of solutions that can be used for groundwater to avoid the sort of over abstraction, but at the same time to identify areas where we feel groundwater still has tremendous opportunities to support livelihood, uh, livelihoods. And then finally, the SDGs. We know about SDG 6, but water actually is quite pervasive and goes across many of these SDGs, and we see there's a strong need to look beyond just the individual SDGs when we're looking at water. The whole question of the nexus that was here in the Bonn 2011 conference, Yoko and I were involved with that, Thomas also very much, uh, was trying to get the message across that um, you can take actions in one area that then can have a perverse effect in, a, in another area, and you know, how can you avoid that? So this is, I think, going to be very important as we move forward in the discussions on the SDGs. So maybe there's uh, seven or eight which are, where it's very clear that water has a linkage, and there's a lot more where water has a sort of secondary influence as well. And how do we reflect that in the reporting mechanisms of the SDGs? It's a challenge for all of us, I think. So, thank you very much indeed. I hope I've left some time for some questions. Thank you so much, Jeremy. This was really uh, a set of extremely interesting topics. Um, uh, the three which you emphasized, but uh, cross-cutting issues as well. Um, um, we are starting a new cooperation, you mentioned that, um, on your topic number two, um, and uh, we look forward to that. Um, Seth is uh, uh, deeply into water stuff, um, related to water sanitation, Harris and agriculture linkages, but also river basin modeling, um, and uh, the link to agriculture productivity in the US. Colleagues, uh, <coughs> I'm sure you have questions uh, or comments. Uh, feel free to do so. Um, may I ask who would like to kick it off? Well, um, if you don't, I do, but I have two already. Uh, one, two. Go ahead, please. Um, you discussed uh, the, the reduction of pathogens in, uh, in these uh, um, uh, people sludge processing mm -hmm. I was wondering, um, some regions uh, probably have more industrial water coming in there, which also have toxic substances. Mm -hmm. Are there approaches to also reduce those toxic substances in, in these uh, schemes? We're, we're starting with the more simple ones first, trying to take a low-hanging fruit by, by targeting those areas which are more domestic uh, rather than coming from, an, uh, you know, from big uh, septic tanks related to uh, domestic dwellings and also public latrines as well. Mm -hmm. uh, not so much from the industrial areas. But I mean, I, I know, I mean it's not, and it's not my area, I will declare that straight away. But clearly there are a number of organizations working on their more, more complex issues of mm -hmm. recovery from areas where they're both industrial but also pharmaceutical uh, wastes and things as well. Um, but it's not something we've been, we wanted to target something which had sort of the, uh, quite a big impact on, uh, on, on the domestic area first. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so, <coughs> Nicholas, next. Please, colleagues, introduce yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I'm Nicholas Gerber from mm. DEF. Um, we've, we've had um, a student working in India in very urban areas where she found out uh, looking at the use of different uh, type of waters for irrigation mm -hmm. and what were the, <coughs> the, 
had the impact uh, on, on, on the water users, the, the households. And she found that um, um, the households that were actually <coughs> using the wastewater from, from the urban area were actually not as bad off as the people who were using usual canal water, meaning that that canal water was even more dirty than the wastewater. Mm -hmm. So do you have a sense of how, how important it is to devise regulations about how to use wastewater uh, compared to making sure that uh, the other water that the irrigators are using is mm. actually not just as contaminated. Mm. Mm. Good question. I mean, it's, yeah, I mean you, because you think it's canal water, therefore, you know, it should be clean or should be sufficiently clean to use for agriculture. But um, I, Julie, have you, I haven't come across anything like that. I mean, I, don't, no. I know certainly from, you know, if you look at some of the areas in Pakistan and in, in India and uh, uh, around uh, Lahore, for example, I mean the pollution loads going into the canals there are significant. Um, well, we did some studies on the Mursi River where we looked yeah. uh, like uh, across the, the Mursi River how the water quality changed. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously, if you went further from the city, it would uh, dramatically uh, change, uh, get better actually, mm -hmm. because there was a lot of pollution settling down also. Um, but but I think it's also difficult to make that clear cut division between the wastewater streams and the canal. And so for us, and as Jeremy was already saying, because in a lot of areas where we work, it is primarily this domestic pollution and the industrial pollution is in specific places, not the places where we necessarily look. But there is, but what what is a wastewater canal and what is an irrigation canal and what is a, a stream? You know, the, it's it's all pretty mixed. So mm -hmm. it would be difficult for us to draw such clear-cut solutions like our conclusions on uh, the quality is better here or there. So I, I guess it differs per place more than per type of stream because they're, they're, it's very mixed in terms of what comes, what goes into the water. Well, I think it's a huge issue in terms of something that could be looked at more in terms of you know, very little work is done on, <coughs> on testing, routinely testing the quality of canal water. I think, and I mean, I was looking at a case in, it's in Faisalabad and uh, and there you had a situation where the canal was unlined canal going through and then there was a certain amount of seepage from that canal and then municipal pumps along the side pumping into the town you know and then it had some secondary treatment afterwards but um in fact and then they were saying well we should really line the canal stop the seepage and then the municip that municipality can actually take water out of the out of the canal which is actually the wrong answer because once it gone through that filtering through the sand you know the banks it was probably a lot better quality than it would have been if it came straight from the canal, as you as you talked. But no, that's a good point. We should that's what we look at. Mm -hmm. We have uh, this type of work ongoing, mm -hmm. uh, just about to complete in four countries: uh, mm -hmm. Bangladesh, India, Ghana, Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, we we drove it a bit further to health outcomes mm -hmm. in these areas where uh, black water was used for irrigation. Uh, income didn't matter for his outcome. Uh, mm. Diarrhea, infectious mm. diseases were so rampant. Yeah. Yeah. So that would drive us to the question um, to prevent getting water black in the first place uh, rather than then to filter out the fertilizer nuggets from it. Mm. Uh, how about that trade-off? Uh, I mean, isn't the fertilizer pellet approach and using the nutrients from, from the sludge. Uh, an end of pipe technology, isn't there? What's, what's the alternative? How do you see the alternative to keep the water clean in the first place? Well, I think we're talking two slightly different things. I mean, the, the, the fecal sludge one was related to human waste See, coming from the centric tanks. Out of yeah, the so, so I mean, and there's very little you can yeah. do, I think, for the human body to, to change that. But if it so for the wastewater issue, too. which was coming from, you know, the wastewater which was coming more from, you say, from urban environment like the Musi River or something, then I agree. I mean, obviously, yes, to be able to treat that to a level or to avoid it being polluted by, you know, separating out waste streams or whatever, um, or treating them to a certain level that they could be used for a particular purpose, whether it's industry or agriculture, is maybe the ultimate objective like we would have here in Europe. But how long is it going to take to get there? And in the intermediate time, as I was saying, I mean, you look at all those treatment plants which have been put in with Dutch funding, funding and other funding, 
and yet, you know, two or three years later, not working. Uh, we have the rea reality there, which I would say is going to be there for a generation. So, I think yes, I agree. It's it's something which we'd be striving for, but maybe in the short term, we still have to deal with this problem. Mm -hmm. Sure. Thank you. Please. Uh, my name is Miguel from the Institute of Geography. Uh, if you look at Africa, I mean, uh, I'm from Ethiopia, and if you look at the investment of water resource development in Africa, I can speak particularly in Ethiopia for the industry, you find out that it's quite astonishing, although water is important, investment in water resource development is really quite uh, insignificant over the last 50, 60 years. Mm. Do, do, do you see any development I mean, I think the investment <coughs> focus has been more on the wash sector than it has on the agricultural and irrigation sector. You know, so I think you know, since um, what, 20, 30 years ago, irrigation had a very bad name in the World Bank, Asian Development Bank, yeah. and so you saw the level of investment going off. I think you're seeing a complete turnaround now. I mean, the, uh, both the African Development Bank and the World Bank are putting in very large amounts of funding into uh, agricultural water management. The concern we have there, I mean, if we did, I'm not sure about Ethiopia, but in the in West Africa, there's a major initiative with the World Bank on the um, Sahel irrigation. Uh, and initially, the idea was to you know, to look at formalised surface irrigation systems. And there's been a legacy of a number of failed large-scale irrigation systems in the world. So that the what we've been discussing with the World Bank and others is how can you actually then have a a better spectrum of development. So yes, you do need large-scale irrigation systems in some areas, but you also need these smaller-scale agri-water management type solutions that I was talking about with the, the guy with a pump on the back of his bicycle going around to service you know, a few farmers until they get to the point where they can, they can buy their own pump and then you go up through the value chain. So I think that's beginning to change in, in many countries, but it's, 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 it's been a bit of a hiatus, I would say, in investment um, uh, over the years. Maybe we can switch a bit to the energy water nexus issues and the game changer of the solar mm. Mm. Um, mm. Uh, But I don't want to cut off the discussion on the sludge stuff. So. My name is Michael Hubert. Uh, I, am a f uh, I was working with TIZ, uh, or former TPZ, as a technical officer before. My question is, you said it's a big challenge to policy and institutional. Um, related to the topic of wastewater irrigation. But in general, I mean, this is a big challenge, not only for wastewater irrigation. If you look at the changing water availability, it's now with climate change, even unforeseeable, uh, very difficult prognosis and so on. And still, we are struggling with this. So my question is, what in general is the focus? Uh, how does INI deal with the question of water rights and regulations uh, in, a, in this changing world of water availability. Uh, it, is there a special focus on it? Um, because now with uh, looking at this very broad spectrum of, of water security, I mean, that's a central question, isn't it? And I do not see so far somebody who really focus strongly on this topic recently. FAO came out with a special paper talking about water tenure, looking more at the <coughs> relationships between different stakeholders to ensure that there is proper framework and so on. So my question is, what does INI do in this field and how does it concentrate on this issue? Well, I think that's right. I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, I think you, know, you can come up with endless numbers of solutions which are great at pilot level, but then you know, how do you replicate those and get them taken up more generally? And often it's the institutional or regulatory side of the, the equation, which is the, the, the barrier. And um, you know, as a research organization, we're being challenged much more to address those issues up front. You know, before, it was sort of, well, let's do the research, let's demonstrate these wonderful solutions, and then hope that somebody will take them up. I mean, the design of the research programs we're involved in now actually start a little bit from the other end. and sort of saying, well, what would need to be put in place? And then what research questions need to be framed around, around that? And it's influenced the way we work 
quite significantly, I think. And again, I come back to the maybe our Tata cooperation in India is one of the, the most successful of those. When the Ag Water Solutions program with uh, with Gates Foundation also was was very important there, which worked in four countries in, in Africa and two states in India. And I think you know, the way that it's been done in in uh, in India is to engage very early on with the policymakers in terms of uh, trying to discuss what, and identifying those policymakers where we see there's an appetite for change. So working with the states which could then be seen as examples for others. And that's why, I mean, you know, Gujarat with uh, uh, Maharashtra, with Karnataka and others where we've had some, some degree of success. And um, trying to generate the level of interest around potential solutions. Um, and think out of the box a little bit because recognizing the political sensitivity of this, as I mentioned before, you know, it's, it's, it's still not something which the states are prepared to do is reduce the subsidy on agricultural tube wells. So what are the other ways you can address, you can address that? Um, yeah, I, I, I suppose just providing, providing the evidence and then like we've been done in, doing in West Bengal is, is going back and then doing an impact study to demonstrate you know, two, three years later what the consequences are. Mm -hmm. But recognizing it is, it's not a linear process, it's a very cyclical process and you need feedback to then adjust the policy. Uh, I mean, that, that, that um, Jyotigram program, I mean, it worked in Gujarat, it didn't work in Rajasthan. It was a different context and it, it needs a different approach. And now we're trying to go back and look and see whether that can, how that, would, how that could be adapted. Um, yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. It's an institutional policy level which is which is fundamental to it. Mm -hmm. Then, um, if you look around, where which is the hottest river these days? You would probably look at the Nile, not in terms of temperature mm -hmm. but political heat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have managed uh, a river commission. Uh, your comment on. Uh, the consequences of the big dam in Ethiopia. Uh, what what are fair and good solution criteria among the three or four countries affected by it? Um, and uh, is it going to be uh, settled peacefully and well? Let's assume that for a moment. But uh, your comment on what's happening to the Nile right now? Yeah, it's a. I mean, it's, it's, I think it's a different situation between the long-term consequence of the development upstream, which I think could have positive benefits you know, throughout the region, and the short-term issues relating to the immediacy of the filling regime of the, of the dam, which could have serious consequences downstream in, uh, in, in terms of salinity situation in the Nile. And so if I was going to you know, try and focus on where you would identify a solution it would be around that uh, filling program and how you can then you know, model that and look at the trade-offs between uh, short-term filling and longer-term filling and the salinity downstream, because that's where I think the real issue is going to be. In 10 years, 12 years, I don't think that will still be the, 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 the question. Um, so whether you could you know, bring the parties together to you know, look at the, the, the groups you know, purchasing the power the groups who want to generate the power and the groups that may be you know, affected downstream to come up with solutions where there are you know, trade-offs and, and transfers of resources between those to, to find a solution uh, is difficult. I mean, I, the, again, I think when it, one of you, if you look at the Mekong, one of the reasons that there was a confidence amongst the, the countries to engage around developing a strategic plan for the, ba for the basin, which is the first time that was done was in 2010, was the fact that they worked together for 20, 30 years on collecting data, analyzing the data, using the models. The same people who've been involved in that process were now sort of moved up the system into quite influential positions within the ministries. But they were familiar with each other and they're using a common knowledge base around which they could argue or, or whatever. So even if the model was run in Vietnam or in Cambodia or in, or in Thailand, the results would be, would be the same. That's, mis that's missing, I think, from, from the Nile. So that, that sort of lack of a common knowledge base and understanding of the situation, uh, the dialogue is not, is not that, that space for dialogue is not there at the moment, and, and that's where I would probably start. Yeah. Well, we have a small project on the Nile with partners here, mm. but uh, I, 
I would very much agree that a lot mm. of investment in knowledge and how to combine uh, sharing water with uh, sharing trade and uh, 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 facilitating uh, a productive exchange of, mm. of all the goods uh, <coughs> uh, along the basin, not just the water. I, mean, that's I think one of the limitations of some of these river commissions is that they have a mandate which restricts them to water. And yet, as you say, the solutions will come from probably a combination of sectors interacting. Yeah. So that they don't exchange bullets. Okay, <laughs> colleagues, uh, time is up. Um, uh, if you want to catch our featured speaker for a moment uh, before he needs to rush away, Jeremy, it's always a pleasure to have you here and uh, you bring something very interesting and new to our water debates. I would have loved to talk more about the uh, energy mm. and uh, solar game changing. Um, I think if we don't get this uh, into a framework as you have presented, which I found extremely interesting, um, uh, solar pumping may run wild. Mm. And uh, so an environmental solution to the energy problem may lead to a major problem on another environmental yeah. front, which yeah. is water. So yeah. and you're in the middle of that. That's great. So we wish you luck for your work, and thanks for coming. Great. Thanks. 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 Thanks.